All right. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to First Things First, the best way to start your day to get your cyber threat intel. We are going to listen to the Cybersecurity Headlines podcast by um, CISO Series. So if you're interested in you know that for yourself, go to CISOseries.com. We're going to listen to it, and then I am going to provide uh, my my thoughts, reflections, and how you know, I would tie it into my day-to-day -day job. I am a practicing information security officer at a mid-sized manufacturing company, and I do this every day. So grab your coffee and let's get into it. From the CISO series, it's Cybersecurity Headlines. It's Friday, December 10th, 2021. The volume of attacks on IoT and OT devices increasing. A new study commissioned by Microsoft shows that 44% of more than 600 respondents interviewed said their organization experienced a cyber incident that involved an IoT or OT device in the past two years. 39% said such a device was the target of the attack, and 36% said the device was leveraged to conduct a broader attack. This includes lateral movement, detection evasion, and persistence. Less than one-third of the respondents said their organization has a complete inventory of devices, and 42% don't have the ability to detect vulnerabilities affecting IoT and OT devices. 61% have low or average confidence when it comes to identifying compromised systems, and nearly half still mainly rely on manual processes to identify and correlate impacted devices. Roughly half of the respondents said their OT network is connected to the corporate IT network, and 56% admitted that their OT network is directly connected to the Internet. Okay, geez, wow. So if you caught yesterday's episode with Clint Bodungeon talking about industrial control systems and operational technology, then this won't surprise you. Um, basically, what we're hearing is that IoT, which I'm less concerned about, and OT um, networks are in devices are actually causing the problem for many organizations, like 66%. There was a bit of a popsicle headache with the math that they were doing there. But basically, what, what you need to take away from this, and it's this is so true no matter where you go, and you're going to find it in manufacturing, healthcare, and uh, energy sectors specifically the most is that operational technology and IoT devices, like they do a specific thing and vulnerability scanners will knock them over. So they're typically on their own network segment. They don't wanna be bothered. They don't wanna be patched because it can, it, it might require recertification. It might require, you know, all these things. So those things get left alone by the security tooling. What does that mean? It means if I'm an attacker, if I'm going to find those OT and IoT devices because I know the security team is basically told to stay away from them, right? You can bury in there. You don't even have to have a great persistence mechanism. You could put Netcat on there. The thing could be loud as crap. Mimikatz could be running on there and nothing's going to detect it because we're not putting EDR agents on those devices. We are not scanning them. Uh, and, and frankly, I'm not surprised. The fact that they have OT devices connected to the internet is a little disconcerting, but like Clint Bodungeon said in yesterday's live stream, um, those devices, the idea that OT is not connected to the IT network is uh, a fallacy, frankly. So um, not surprising here. We, you, you know, there is a product, just as a quick aside, there's a product called Armis, and I, I don't have any affiliation to them, but they do passive vulnerability scanning versus active vulnerability scanning to help solve this particular problem problem. Uh, but this is a real problem. Okay. All right, let's go. Cloudflare and others form incident response cyber insurance. Cloudflare, Mandiant, SecureWorks, and CrowdStrike are creating a rapid referral partnership for under-attack companies in response to insurance premiums that have increased upwards of 50%. Marketed as a cyber risk partnership program, the service combines incident response, insurance, and mitigation. The partnership includes three U.S.-based insurance brokers and seems to be aimed at organizations that see security attack insurance as an expensive luxury. IT executives have... Okay, so check this out. This is actually quite big also. So Cloudflare, Mandian, and a couple other ones are banding together to offer some type of kind of insurance packaging thing most what okay so cyber insurance is something i'm crazy passionate about but it's like a wicked dull topic a lot of people don't care about it listen to me it is getting super important now 
insurance companies have pivoted, right? If you work in the industry and you've had to renew your insurance policy lately, I guarantee you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Insurance companies have pivoted to giving everyone a, a policy for whatever, like a big land grab into being much more selective. And, and frankly, it's hard to get an insurance policy now or one that's actually priced at an appropriate rate because they're saying you need MFA on everything. You need privileged access management and you need asset inventory. Uh, PAM and asset inventory are quite difficult to achieve. Uh, and you can't put MFA on certain things, right? Go back to what we just talked about with this OT network stuff. Okay, so what it, what this is saying is uh, the insurance companies, they obviously don't want to pay out those premiums. Not that they won't pay it out, but they'd rather the organization just be protected and not suffer an incident. So by pairing with these industry leaders like Mandy and Cloudflare, what they're doing is they're they're enabling organizations to have access to resources where they can mitigate down the risk of being impacted and then have the ability to quickly have response to limit the damage and 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 basically understand what the what the heck's going on. And by the way, when you have a mandiant, for example, that's doing incident response at this organization, this organization, this organization, they are seeing trends, they're seeing patterns, they're identifying behaviors, and they're getting quite good at incident response. So this is a great this is great for our industry. And hopefully this can help uh, some organizations get access to insurance that basically were just priced out. Um, yeah, Jeremiah Grossman said it in 2015. The insurance companies are deciding which pro which way we're going with our cybersecurity programs. All right, let's go. Let's continue on. Is likely to face the axe after breaches are shortages to blame. Senior IT and cybersecurity professionals are nearly half as likely to be fired following a data breach today versus three years ago. This, according to new data from Kaspersky. Its newly published report, IT Security Economics 2021, revealed that just 7% of organizations laid off senior IT staff following a security breach in 2021 versus 12% in 2018. The figure for senior security staff was 8% this year versus 14% three years ago. The findings might indicate that skills shortages are biting across the globe, a concept supported by a study from ISC Squared that revealed 2.7 million security professionals are still needed worldwide, meaning the workforce is still 65% below what it needs to be. Yeah. Okay. So this isn't surprising. Um, what, what the story is, is basically that there is uh, data to support the idea that even when there's a major breach, um, the executives that are in charge, they say IT executives in this case, but I would think IT and information security are not being fired or there less of them are being fired. Um, they say it might be because of skill shortage, that's speculation. I would argue that yes, it is partly skill shortage because finding those senior people to take on a program is hard, but also you know, for lack of a better term, we have, we practitioners have basically educated our um, business community to understand that it's not if you're going to get attacked, it's when you get attacked and it's not cybersecurity, it's cyber resiliency. This is, this is like a, a grassroots thing that I'm trying to push. I got to get t-shirts made up, say I work in cyber resiliency, but the, the thing is crap happens. We know that like you're going to the business regularly saying, I need funding, I need budget for these toolings. We don't have SecOps capability. We Our email filtering is terrible. And then when you get popped, yeah, you know, they're upset, but they need you to work through the incident and then be able to recover nicely back into it. I got to tell you right now, this is kind of uh, uh, morbid or, you know, dark, but like now is like the best time to be in information security, especially at like a, at an information security officer type level, because you you can't lose. Right. Like if you protect the organization and they don't get hit, then you have this wonderful story to tell about how you built a program that kicks butt. If you do get hit, then you have a beautiful story to talk about how you went through the fire and you know what it's like and you you can run through an incident and organizations are expecting to go through incidents right now. So. Uh, you, you really can't lose uh, with that. So let's continue on. I do want to say what's up to Dylan. Dylan, good to see you. Base, always a pleasure. I know it's tough on the West Coast, man. Tom's modding today. Thank you, Tom. Obina, definitely happy to see you. I don't, I didn't see Jess in there yet, but I'm, she might be in there. Let's keep, let's keep rolling. Cox Communications discloses data breach after hacker impersonates support agent. Telecommunication company Cox Communications has disclosed a data breach after a hacker allegedly used social engineering to be able to impersonate a support agent and gain access to customers' personal information. 
While Cox does not state that financial information or passwords were accessed, they are advising affected customers to monitor their financial accounts and to change passwords on other accounts that use the same one as the Cox customer account. And now... Yeah, okay, so basically... <laughs> I don't want to say this is commodity, but, you know, basically uh, spoofing who you are, saying that you're um, customer support IT. We talked about this on Wednesday with the Twitter uh, bots that are responding to people's requests for assistance faster than the actual business can do it. Um, this isn't that much different. Um, frankly, as we go to zero trust architecture to throw a buzzword in there, as we move to zero trust architecture, People are going to have to learn that they need to validate the identity of whomever they're speaking with at any point and assume assume threat until proven otherwise. And I know it's going to be hard and it's going to be super difficult. Hey, David, it's going to be super difficult to train an end user community for that because people like convenience, people like ease. Uh, but as long as, you know, people are, are straight up just looking at their phone and being like, I need help. Yes. Oh, this person's helping me. They're going to be victims. And it's it's you know, it's it's sad, but it's true. So this is uh, what's going on with that. So, edu you know, with this particular one, I would just take it as an opportunity to educate your end user community that these type of things happen, whether it's, um, you know, Cox Cable or it's AT&T or it's even IT support from the organization you're at, have them validate uh, if they can before giving up sensitive information. I feel like you almost want to educate your end users to, to feel a, a bit of a spidey tingle when they're giving something like social security or credit card number or personal or passwords or something like that to an individual on the phone. Your spidey sense should go off. A word from our sponsor, Mo, and send $100 to your favorite cause. Here we go. Over a dozen malicious NPM packages caught hijacking Discord servers. At least 17 malware-laced packages have been discovered on the NPM package registry, according to a recent barrage of malicious software hosted and delivered through open source software repositories such as PyPy and RubyGems. DevOps firm JFrog said the libraries, now taken down, were designed to grab Discord access tokens and environment variables from users' computers, as well as gain full control over a victim's system. As prior research has established, collaboration and communication tools like Discord and Slack have become handy mechanisms for cybercriminals with Discord servers integrated into the attack chains for remotely controlling the affected machines and even to exfiltrate data from the victims. Okay, so this one is interesting. There's two things here for me that I take away from this. One is this isn't the first time that an open source package has been compromised by threat actors and had had like whatever the remote access Trojan or you know the keylogger or whatever um, embedded into the 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 dev flow and get you know gets pushed into production and because so many. So many organizations that develop code, whether it's an in-house solution that you build for solving a little problem or you're like, that's what you do is sell software. A lot of these open source packages are leveraged. And unfortunately, you know, it's open source. Anyone can commit to it. So if it's not a well-maintained package, it's easy for those uh, backdoors and keyloggers and such to get baked in there. So that is something to be aware of. This is We're seeing this more and more, uh, at least I am, in, in the last maybe, I don't know, year. What is really interesting is the attack is on Discord and, and Slack. I think they said Slack also. These these servers, and you guys know what Discord is, right? We're, we're in the Simply Cyber Discord all the time. Yes, we're chatting and stuff, but there is a ton of automation. There's a ton of integrations, you know, uh, that can be leveraged. And, you know, something happens and then it sends a notification or it sends an email or alerts a channel, whatever. Like some of you uh, get the notification from the bots when I go live, right? Well, because businesses are using this to to facilitate communication, to facilitate workflow for the business, um, a lot of people have these applications installed on their workstation, right? Their, their business computer, their personal computer. Uh, so it's very clever of these threat actors to compromise this open source packaging to get baked into Discord and then or to to take advantage of systems that will have Discord installed on them to be able to steal those tokens, steal those session keys, and then, uh, you know, basically take advantage of that access to do all sorts of nefarious stuff. This is a much more longer play than that Cox social engineering thing. Uh, but again, I'll tip my hat to this group right here because 
I, I'll say it a million times until I'm, I'm deaf, man. Like sometimes these threat actors come up with such elegant, clever solutions for their crimes that it, you know, I'm, I'm in awe about it. it. You know, I wish they worked for the good guys, honestly. Microsoft Google OAuth flaws can be abused in phishing attacks. Researchers have discovered a set of previously unknown methods to launch URL redirection attacks against weak OAuth 2.0 implementations. These attacks can lead to the bypassing of phishing detection and email security solutions and at the same time gives phishing URLs a false image of legitimacy to victims. The relevant campaigns were detected by Proofpoint and target Outlook, Web Access, PayPal, Microsoft 365, and Google Workplace. OAuth 2.0 is a widely adopted authorization protocol that allows a web or desktop application access to resources controlled by the end user, such as their email, contacts, profile information, or social accounts. Another story of death by hospital. Okay, so, you know, I'll, I'll be the first to admit I am not an identity and access management professional. That has turned into its own specialty uh, within the information security uh, community. But these OAuth tokens, um, I mean, they're definitely the way that we kind of uh, leverage uh, access and identity in cloud. So you're not logging into everything over and over and over again. It's, it's good. It's good because it's better experience for end users. Uh, including ourselves. Uh, but again, like it seems that it can be abused. I didn't quite understand um, how the phishing attack takes advantage of abusing it. So this story, I might have to go back and and, and reread it to understand it a bit. Uh, but just, I guess the point is, since phishing attack is the threat vector, um, you know, make sure you got good email filtering and make sure like this one, it seems like it's not something that you would educate your end user community about because the flaw is getting the oath token, which or the OAuth token, which they're going to um, then turn around and leverage. Uh, but this one, I'll have to go back and look at. Just it's not surprising though that you know OAuths are being stolen because it is the key that would allow you access to resources as that individual. Ransomware. Prosecutors in Cologne were gearing up to pursue as yet unidentified hackers whose ransomware attack on a hospital in Dusseldorf forced the redirection of a patient arriving by ambulance who was suffering from an aortic aneurysm. The redirection delayed the patient's treatment by an hour, leading to her death. The case was to be tried on the grounds of negligent homicide, meaning the killing of another person through negligence or without malice, but after a two-month investigation it was determined that there were insufficient grounds to pursue the matter any further. This case is similar to one we reported here on Cybersecurity Headlines back in October in which an infant in Atlanta died due to complications seemingly directly related to hospital ransomware. AWS as the Internet's big... Okay, so, uh, yeah, good morning, Brendan, uh, Northern Ireland. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Shineyuri, Shineyuri? Sorry if I butchered that name. It's good to see you. Gia Cuomo, good to see you. So... This is healthcare focus specific story, but it was it was really interesting because it could have set precedents, right? Basically, it, it, you may have heard this a couple months ago. Basically, someone uh, uh, um, this actually wasn't a couple months ago. The baby died was a couple months ago. This was like last year. A person was going to the hospital. They were having like a stroke or heart attack or something, and the hospital was under a ransomware attack and basically rerouted the patient. Said we can't provide uh, uh, healthcare here because we're under attack bring it to another hospital. The uh, The patient ended up dying in route to that second hospital. And this is kind of the, the judicial uh, output of that to see if there was any, um, you know, kind of restitution for the family that, you know, lost the person who died. Uh, it, are they responsible? Is the, is the, is the help, is the hospital responsible for the death of that person because they weren't able to defend uh, from a cyber attack? I'm glad to see um, it sucks that that person died, obviously, but I'm, I'm glad to see that this didn't turn into a thing because, again, like I just said, it's not about cybersecurity. It's about cyber resiliency. You cannot protect yourself. You can't eliminate all the risk, right? And healthcare is – I worked in healthcare for like five, six years. Like it is a tough environment to secure just because of the needs and the requirements and patient safety and a million other things, right? So – uh, I'm glad to see this didn't uh, turn into a thing, but it is interesting uh, um, uh, case study on how the cybersecurity can turn can, you know, it's not just an IT problem, right? It's not just like, oh, I can't get my email. Like it can have profound real life impact. So good to see, you know, you know, I think it's good to see this, but all right. Just single point of failure. 
An opinion piece in Vice describes how this week's AWS outage has shown the world just how much the Internet relies on it and why that's a bad thing. Written by Motherboard senior staff writer Lorenzo Franceschi Biccieri, the article points out that even though lasting just a few hours, the world has seen just how much it now depends on Amazon's infrastructure. Quoting Stephen Belovin, a computer science professor at Columbia University, quote, if an attacker could gain control of AWS infrastructure, they could do very great damage, end quote. The report highlights that access isn't the only concern, but the way in which AWS manages security for its customers' sites means that features such as MFA and SMS verification systems could disappear, as happened recently with Parler. The full editorial is available at vice.com. Yeah, so I would encourage people to, you know, go to this story. I don't have it in the show description or anything like that, but you may want to check this out. We just saw, we talked about this on Wednesday, right? Like everybody on this stream, you know, saw some of the impact of AWS having that outage. Uh, you know, Northern Ireland, I'm not sure it was a U.S. outage, so I'm not sure if it impacted you. But listen, it's a supply chain issue. We are now depending on AWS to deliver not just entertainment, right? But also critical security services like MFA, like, you know, like uh, there's a lot of sassy services like uh, um, Duo, multi-factor, email filtering. Um, Palo Alto has cloud-based SD-WAN um, uh, management consoles and stuff like that. I don't know if they're hosted on AWS, but many are, right? AWS owns 62% of the market of cloud infrastructure and cloud services, right? So when they suffer, everybody suffers. This is not just revealing that if an attacker took down or got into AWS, the level of um, significant impact that they could have globally, but also the the risk in the in the dependency that organizations have on AWS being up. I saw some people joking in some of the discords that I'm on about, you know, you have when you contractually bind yourself to a vendor and they say that they're going to offer availability and uptime and all this other stuff, um, you rely on that. But they are relying upstream on AWS to provide that level of dependency for them. So this trickle down effect um, will impact everybody. This this was really scary and concerning. Um, and uh, just as a quick aside, you know, if you're, f you know, familiar with Simply Cyber and you've been a, a, fr a friend of the show for a while, you know that I do a lot of labs and stuff in AWS. I was, I'm working on a video on doing malware analysis and it, I was in AWS and it was so slow. It was so brutal that I try. I was like, you know what? I'm going to stand one up in uh, Azure right now. I spent like 35 minutes in Azure trying to build a virtual desktop and I couldn't do it. It's like, it's like so, so painfully difficult that you have to like build the tenant, a subscription and all this other jazz that I couldn't even do it. So I, I'm like, I'm, I have to go to AWS. So uh, it's pretty brutal. All right. So that's going to do it for our, um, that's going to do it for our cyber headlines for Friday, December 10th. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, Look, you know, this is going to be Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We do have some uh, guests coming into town, um, and my studio happens to be in the guest bedroom. So uh, just stay tuned. We may take a little brief hiatus from first things first um, through the holidays. I, I will try not to do that, but it may happen. I hope you'd enjoy this. I would encourage everybody, please, if you're if you're not super busy right now, go over to Neil Bridges' uh, stream, um, Tea with a Hacker. He does great work. Uh, base or Tom, if you could drop a, a link in chat uh, to, to um, Neil's stream. And when you get in there, if you could, hashtag Simply Cyber. Let him know I sent you. Let him know that you came here and uh, enjoy yourself. I hope you found this valuable. I'm really, really enjoying this First Things First project, and I look forward to doing it uh, a lot in 2022. All right, everybody, take care, be good, and we'll see you out there.